Good evening from Chile Hamilton. I'm Karen McQuake and I'm the Director of Alumni Advancement at McMaster University. And thank you for joining us for our talk tonight, United, the United States at the Crossroads. McMaster graduate of the class of 1969, Lawrence Martin is a Washington-based public affairs columnist and an author of 10 books, including six national bestsellers. Lawrence served as the Globe's bureau chief in Washington, Montreal, and Moscow, where he opened the paper's first bureau in 1985. He was a national affairs columnist for Southern News and has been a columnist for the Globe since 2002. We're so pleased that Lawrence agreed to join us and uh, as a member of our McMaster alumni family, we're looking forward to a fantastic talk tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Karen. It's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here and to talk to uh, Matt grads so long since I uh, was there, but uh, I get, there, get back there occasionally and uh, enjoy it. The, uh, the university has really uh, enhanced its reputation since my uh, departure, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a great school. And tonight, uh, as you see, we have, we have a very big topic, the United States at the crossroads. Uh, one could go on about that for a few hours. I'll try and keep it uh, limited to 20 minutes or so, then we can take some questions uh, from Karen. I'd like to um, I'd like to start off by, you know, I was first uh, Globe and Mail correspondent back in uh, 1978 uh, when uh, Jimmy Carter was president and um, until uh, 81, 82 when uh, Ronald Reagan was president. Uh, I then uh, went back to uh, Toronto, I guess, for a couple of years and went to, to Moscow and so had a look from the other side from over there. The, um, but I, I'd like to uh, just draw a little bit of a contrast between the Washington of, uh, of that previous era and, and the Washington today, because there are so uh, many dramatic uh, changes. And uh, being in the media, one uh, change I'd like to talk to is, uh, I talk about is, is the media, because it is such a, had such an enormous impact on American society, the change in the media. You know, when I was in Washington uh, covering uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, the, um, there is just basically three big news outlets, uh, television outlets, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And they're all practically the same in the sense if you turned on the 630 News one night and caught them and then the other one, they don't have the sort of the same approach. They're all pretty centrist. Um, they didn't allow the far right or the far left in. The far right or the far left had no platforms back then. And so I think this, uh, when you have uh, the main news outlets preaching a uh, same centrist sort of dialogue, uh, it's much easier to build a consensus in the country around that sort of uh, optic. Um, you know, and you had your big papers back then um, and they had their influence, but uh, you had no, none of the 24 hour news cycles. You had uh, basically no panels discussions, which I have all day, every day, people spouting off their opinions now, uh, dramatically different. And you see today, I, I don't have to go into detail on it, but you know, you have, um, you have, as I said, 24 hour news, talking heads coming at you all the time, not but, but from the left, from the right, uh, you have the lunatic fringe out there sometimes. Uh, they got a piece of the action now. You have Twitter, everybody coming at you on Twitter. I can tell you as a columnist uh, and other columnists will tell you it's become a real headache because practically everything you write, you're, you're gonna get blasted from the left or the right. Um, even if you think you've written the most balanced, fair-minded, uh, article in the world. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's so much easier to be a columnist uh, back in the old days. There's only a letter to the editor or two who could tear you apart. Now there's about a hundred respondents doing that every day. Um, but that's the sort of world we live in. And for, for, for the unity of the United States, it's become so much more difficult because of all these crazy voices coming at you from all over the place. And uh, it's, so hard, it's so hard for anyone to, to agree on anything. So that's one big change. Another is um, the, the, the political party allegiance. Um, you've seen with Donald Trump, an absolutely extraordinary uh, example of the polarization, but 
man, man, anything that, that that guy does, and I've watched them for four years. I've been in watch. I, I'm back in Ottawa now, but, but I, for a while, but I was there for about three and a half years. Uh, anything he does, um, the loyalty was um, extraordinary. It stayed with him. He stayed at 40%, 45%, no matter what, you know, horror he presented or what stumble he made or what good thing he did. Um, and that sort of loyalty is absolutely stunning, especially with a character like Trump, who is so off the wall, um, such a, such a, um, the mad king, as, as, as we call him. But that tells you that about the degree of allegiance uh, in, the, in the political parties um, uh, in the country today, which just wasn't there before. I, mean, I remember, like, if you look at the last few elections, they all, they all have been razor thin because, every, you know, Democrats are about half the population, Republicans are about half the population. You can't shake them out of their boxes. In the old days, um, when I was there, 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 people were winning landslides, you know, um, Richard Nixon won a landslide in 72, Ronald Reagan won a big one in 1980, a landslide in 1984, uh, LBJ won a landslide in 1964. So um, that, um, was something that, uh, that 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 is to be noted because it be, it speaks to the degree of polarization in society today that people won't move off their, their parties. The allegiances are that deep. The ideologies are that deep. Another thing contributing to unity back then um, in the Carter Reagan era was the was the. Um, the foreign policy, there was a common enemy uh, that people could focus on back then. It was, uh, of course, the Soviet Union, the evil empire, as Ronald Reagan called it. And of course, uh, back then, of course, you had the uh, Iranian hostage crisis as, as well. So the, the, the American public, uh, uh, Democrat and Republican could, you know, focus on an enemy, which is always, you know, when just like when there's a big foreign war going on, the country can come together. You don't have that kind of thing today. So these are some of the contrasts that uh, and some of the major changes that uh, we've, we've seen since then. And um, this is um, the type of uh, America that, uh, that Joe Biden uh, is, is coming into. And one of the questions about this, about the, we wanted to talk about was, can Biden end the uncivil war in the United States? Well, I guess the short answer is no, but he might be able to, uh, to, to, to draw it down draw it down a bit. Um, first of all, it's, it's extraordinary that, that Biden is president. I remember being in a New Hampshire, a New Hampshire primary a year ago, small town in New Hampshire, and um, Biden was basically dead. We were all written, writing him off. He had lost the first big primary in Iowa. He was getting demolished in New Hampshire on his way to losing by a huge margin. And, and uh, you figured if he lost the first two, he would be, uh, he'd be gone. Um, and that talk he gave that, that day, he rambled on for about an hour, walking around everybody. It, it was a, there's a great uh, sadness about it. It's like he was sort of saying goodbye. I think he's, he, we got the feeling he was even writing himself up. But then um, the um, South Carolina primary happened. He was expected to win in South Carolina. He won by more than expected. And then, uh, but Pete Buttigieg made the big move. Pete Buttigieg was actually leading him in delegates at the time, but he decided that uh, I'm going to stop Bernie Sanders. I'm going to uh, drop out of the race. I'm going to go to Joe, Joe Biden. And he brought, uh, he brought Klobuchar around with him. And, you know, then Super Tuesday came and Joe, Joe Biden cleaned up. And that was the end of uh, Bernie Sanders, which is probably fantastic for the United States because you had Sanders squaring off against uh, against uh, Donald Trump in the election, uh, man, that would have been, talk about civil, still uncivil war, be more closer to the, take the un off type of thing. Um, but that was a stroke of luck for, for Biden that everything fell into, it fell into his hands. Uh, he is a man for the times, I think, uh, the, the Amer Americans need a healer and he's a, uh, he's a conciliator in that sense. Uh, he's been around for so long. He knows where all the, the pitfalls are. He does have a working class streak in them. He can reach out to people. He enjoys meeting people. He um, enjoys just gabbering on and on and on about this and that. He is a common sort of Joe in a way. And I think this is really going to help, um, help, you know, soothe the atmosphere and 
bring people together in a, to a certain degree down there uh, to have a, you know such a contrast, of course, to uh, to Donald Trump, uh, the, the, the the wackiest president the country has ever seen, the most volatile president the country's probably ever seen. Um, and this has got to have some calming effect, I would think. Um, but you know, Biden's bringing the very leftist policy agenda. Um, this, of course, raises hackles on the right. This is not something to uh, to uh, to uh, to attract a great body of uh, Republicans to. Uh, you know, if you look at some of his policies, it's the most left-wing type of policy slate, maybe since uh, since Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the, and the New Deal. So. So Joe has got a new New Deal, you know, when you look at his, um, his um, <clears throat> economic stimulus plans, his plans for addressing uh, climate change, uh, his plans for uh, increasing taxes, his plans for increasing health care, um, dramatic, dramatic changes uh, that, um, um, that will certainly shift the dial in that country, but will be very hard for him to uh, implement. Um, He's operating with small, small majorities in both the House and, and the Senate. He's operating against a Supreme Court that is dominated by the conservative element. Um, and, you know, we talk about comparing him to FDR, but, you know, FDR had a big foreign war, World War II, to bring the, bring the country together. FDR didn't have the, the media, um, media ecosystem, the crazy media ecosystem that Biden uh, faces uh, today. Um, FDR had a more unified country to begin with than, uh, uh, than Joe Biden. And so it's, uh, it's gonna be hard for him to, um, to follow in those kind of footsteps. Um, but there is um, some fortune that has come his way. I mean, his timing is very good. He's, uh, he comes in when the, when the vaccine comes right on stream and the vaccine is going to, within months, hopefully, remove this, uh, this, this uh, horrific vi uh, virus uh, uh, causing enormous death toll in the United States from the country. It's gonna uplift the mood of the country. Uh, it's gonna uplift the economy because people are going to want to get out there and spend, to get out there and travel. Um, and so, you know, from that point of view, uh, Joe is being lucky again, just like he got lucky uh, in the primaries. It's taken, taken him 50 years of politics to to be here now, but um, but but here he is. Um, he <clears throat> he, however, is running into uh, the authoritarian populism on the right that um, the degree of which has not been seen in the United States before. Um, the uh, Mitch McConnell is not going away. It's fascinating to read uh, to read. Um, President Barack Obama's memoir, Promised Land, in which he really gets into this, how the Republicans blocked him every step of the way. And he said something extremely interesting in that book about Mitch McConnell. He said, you know, McConnell was so knee-jerk, I could predict exactly that he was going to anything I talked about, he's going to shoot, uh, shoot, shoot, shoot down. But Obama went on to say that he could understand McConnell doing this because uh, Obama had looked at history, some history, and he, and he had seen that when any time the party in opposition tries to cooperate, um, they ended up losing votes. And he said, if you examine the elections, it was on, only by uh, rejecting government policy at all the time when they actually did better in a pursuant election. So uh, Joe Biden won't, won't like to hear that, but uh, that's what he faces uh, um, against the Republicans. They're not going to be bending on anything, I don't think, despite Joe's, you know, trying to reach out to everybody and say, let's all be peaceful and nice and together. Um, you know, his main headache is going to be, and we'll get into uh, Mr. Trump now and whether he can uh, survive or not, but um, that is going to be the big thorn in uh, Joe Biden's side. Um, some form of Trumpism is going to remain in the United States. The, um, you know, it is very, very, very remotely possible that uh, uh, enough Republicans could move on their impeachment vote next week uh, to impeach them and prevent Donald Trump from ever running again. 
which would be a great thing for the Republican Party, by the way, I think. But um, I don't think that's going to happen. There's a chance. Um, some form of Trumpism is going to remain even if Donald Trump goes in the form of his, his, uh, his son or in the form of his daughter. If he was eliminated from the scene, one of them, one of them would probably pick up the torch um, and um, carry Trumpism forward. As we talked about earlier, there was a, it wouldn't be 40% of the population are radical right or far right, but a huge percentage are. Uh, Trump still maintains that base despite, uh, despite in, encouraging the raid on the Capitol, despite all the crazy stuff he's done since being elected, claiming he, uh, being unelected, claiming, claiming he won a land, landslide and so on. Um, those people are not going to go away. Those people will be enormous headaches for, uh, for, for, Joe, for Joe Biden. If Donald Trump uh, stays afoot, if he stays out of jail, even if he's sent to jail for six months or whatever for some uh, financial misbehavior, misbehavior in New York, he would uh, emerge as a hero. Uh, Napoleon coming back to fight the wars. Uh, he has a huge pot full of money. Um, he, is, uh, he, he, is, he is in a rage that he lost because in his crazy imagination, he doesn't think he lost. So we're going to see this um, um, Trumpism in some form what would be great for the Democratic Party is if uh, the Republican Party splits in two. I think there's a very good chance of this. Um, the, there's so many people who, who loathe Trump in that party and what Trump has done. Uh, there's so many people who uh, are just uh, totally loyal to him. It's really hard to see the two sides of the, the party remaining as one. Um, I think that, you know, Trump has hinted he might go off and form uh, what he calls the, um, the Patriot Party. Um, now, if that happened, if the right divided into two, this would be the biggest boost for the uh, Democratic Party, one could imagine, because uh, it means they would automatically win the, win the next election, which uh, we don't know whether Joe Biden will be contesting or not. The... Um, um, we should address the, uh, the whole notion of um, violence uh, and, and is, is violence is uh, pockets of civil war um, possible in the United States? Could this situation get out of hand? Um, you know, when you're talking about Trump, uh, nothing is off the table as we've seen. He'll say anything, he's prepared to uh, do anything. Oddly, you know, He's not a guy who likes war. I mean, if you look at his foreign policy, one of the good things Donald Trump did, I think, was to, you know, his promise to uh, end the endless wars and to uh, get away from this whole role as uh, America, the, the big policeman out there, uh, interfering in uh, wherever they want to interfere. I think that was a popular policy for him. And so it's a, a contradiction is that he's such a warrior character, such a pugilist, but he really doesn't, doesn't like uh, wars that much. But um, he could, you know, he's the type of guy who could encourage those same, those same type of people who attack the Capitol uh, to go to war for him uh, elsewhere on the, on the domestic front. It's something he cannot rule out, even though he'll have a man at the top in, in Joe Biden uh, trying to reduce, uh, reduce the, uh, the temperatures. Um, but the... Um, I think the mood in the United States is um, is switching over to the uh, to the liberal side. Um, you know, if you look at the, the history, it sort of goes in cycles. Maybe you had um, FDR who, who replaced uh, Hoover and Calvin Coolidge in, in a big conservative era then, brought in the New Deal and swung the pendulum west and left and it remained that way through most of the next four decades through uh, Lyndon Johnson and his Great Society programs, uh, right through to Reagan uh, toppled, uh, toppled uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, Jimmy Carter who suffered through the, the stagflation of the, uh, of the late 1970s and uh, really ran, ran into an unfortunate timing. But Reagan took over and, um, and, and the right took over. The, the conservative, conservative right took over through George H.W. Bush, um, you had uh, Bill Clinton was sort of Republican light in a way, then you had 
uh, Bush Jr., who was more conservative than his father. Then you had the Tea Party. Even Barack Obama was um, couldn't really implement his progressive agenda. But now I think there's a bigger swing uh, in the liberal direction. Um, it seems that um, the the temper of this of that society, uh, the demographic shifts, are moving it uh, to the left of the spectrum. Um, it seems to me that, especially if we see a break of the uh, of the um, conservative Republican Party, a breakup, uh, we could have a long, long run of uh, of uh, uh, leftish policy in the United States. Um, maybe not 40 year cycle, but uh, quite a run of it because uh, the, the whole conservative uh, party there is, is basically uh, in chaos. Um, I should uh, add a few uh, words about uh, the relationship with uh, Canada, which you might get into in some, some, some questions here, but um, you know, uh, having, <clears throat> covered the US and Canada for, for so long, it's, um, it really um, is extraordinary to watch how Canadians react to presidents. And in almost every case for the last many decades, um, Canadians have showed uh, what a moderate people they are in the sense that when a Republican president like George W. Bush or Donald Trump comes along, they can't stand them like it's been 80% want these, don't want anything, Canadians don't want to have anything to do with these guys. Uh, or better, they love Barack Obama. They loved, they love Joe Biden. They really, really like Bill Clinton. Tells you something about our, our society and, uh, and, the moderate, uh, and the moderate nature of it. Um, I think, you know, Biden got off to a bad start with Canada in terms of, um, you know, the, Keystone XL pipeline and canning that and promising uh, government procurement policies by America, which might be without some Canadian stuff. But um, I think Biden will be a great, great uh, friend of Canada. And um, I think that um, he might do something great for, for us. I think he might uh, uh, come into some excess uh, surplus vaccines down there and ship them up our way, which, which would be uh, a great, great thing. Um, so Karen, I'll leave you with, I'll leave you with that and uh, I'll take some of your questions. Well, great. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. Um, I will have to tell you that you hold the record of most submitted questions for a webinar. So we have tons of questions to get through. We're going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, but someone's actually sent in a message that we're going to go back in time to your time at McMaster. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, at Mac, were you involved with the silhouette? And if so, how did that prepare you for your life in journalism? That was it. I mean, uh, when I went to McMaster, um, 66, 67, I walked into the McMaster Silhouette office and in, in the late uh, great Wentworth house, which has been torn down. Um, and um, I started working on that paper on the editor. There, there was Peter Calamai, a great late McMaster grad who you knew, right? Yep. He taught me how to write, uh, he became a famous journalist. He taught me how to write my first news story in the McMaster silhouette. It was about Shinerama. How Shinerama was doing. Shinerama is still going, right? Yep. That's amazing. Um, and so I started working on the silhouette. I became editor of that paper. Didn't go to my classes. It had a terrible effect on my academics, but I enjoyed newspapering so much. Um, at the silhouette, I was uh, looking back, I was a pretty lousy editor, by the way, didn't know much of really. <laughs> Um, but anyway, it got me, it led me to a job at the Hamlin Spectator. I started freelancing for, from McMaster to the Spectator and then, um, then went on to the, uh, the Globe and Mail in, uh, 1974. But, um, yeah, McMaster paved, paved the way. That was, uh, if it had not been for the silhouette, I, I don't know what I'd be doing. All right. Well, there's a good shout out to the silhouette. Um, the next question's around, um, 
where you ended off with Canada and U.S. relations. I'm going to try to combine two questions for you. So what do you, what do you think the future of the relationship between Canada and the U.S.? And the second part of the question, um, do you think Biden can rebuild relations with traditional allies, allies and reestablish the trends that were in place towards globalism and trade? Sure. For the future of Canada, you know, we went through this uh, really, really, awkward and negative period with Donald Trump, who did not have any respect for Canada or know about it or care about it the way most all other presidents have. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't come here. He had a big fight with Trudeau on this and that. He imposed uh, aluminum and steel tariffs. It was pretty bad. Um, Biden has a deep uh, sense of Canada. He's been there a lot. He's, he's met with Trudeau. He had a great meeting with Trudeau. They have a great meeting of minds. They, you know, they're both uh, progressive people. They both see eye to eye on policy uh, making. And uh, I think that, um, you know, despite trade spats, which are inevitable, inevitable we're, we were going to have a, uh, a very, very uh, warm relationship with American Americans. Canadians will be traveling down there again. They won't uh, they won't um, have the uh, animosity that they had coming from the uh, from the Trump regime. You know, if you look at the history of Canada-U.S. relations, it um, um, it can never get that bad because we are so economically intertwined. We basically have to get along. So. <laughs> uh, and it's always happened that whenever we've gone through a bad stretch, there's a there's a, there's a good stretch. And I think there'll be a good stretch again. I think Canadians though, uh, had a little bit of a um, eye opener though, to see how different Americans are than, than we are, to see how many are on the alt-right in the United States, to see how many uh, are of redneck persuasion or on the far right, um, absolutely uh, extraordinary. Uh, and, and yeah, a, a wake up call that, uh, you know, it could reach the point it did right down there with that, that attack on the Capitol. And with so many people, uh, more than 70 million voting for Donald Trump, uh, despite, yeah. uh, despite the policies that, that he brought forward. Um, I should say on that note, you know, that um, uh, we did uh, escape a bit of a danger zone in terms of where we don't have the, the degree of the far right in Canada, anywhere near that they have. But we did, um, we do we do have uh, the extreme right in Canada, we do have the hard right in Canada. It could have got uh, a foothold up here had uh, Fox News North made it here. We had uh, you know, Stephen Harper, um, his favorite channel is the Fox News. He, he um, went down to New York, met the owner of Fox News, arranged for a, a Sun, the Sun TV channel up here to be a facsimile of Fox News uh, with uh, the Quebec financier, I forget his name at the moment. Um, and that had that station got a toehold. It, it, it uh, you know, had, uh, you know, editorials every night, much like Fox News, as the Levant was leading them off. Had that got a foothold, that station up here, that would have been a real outlet for that element of the population it would have grown. So, so we just dodged a bullet there. Now, as for the treatment of the allies, yeah, I mean, uh, Biden is a old fashioned a multilateralist. Uh, Trump was a nationalist, a unilateralist, big contrast then. Uh, Biden, uh, Biden really, really respects the allies, really wants to get along in the world. When I go back to that, that, that talk he gave in, in New Hampshire, he said, he basically was saying that you know, um, you have to know everybody to be a good president. I know everybody in the world. I've been to every country in the world. He's going on and on like this, you know, because he's been in politics so long. And it was true. Mm -hmm. He did, he did uh, know that. And he had a great, great pride in his knowledge of the world and knowing leaders, knowing how to get along with them. So I think we're going to see a lot of that uh, from this president getting along up there. So um, you mentioned about um, Fox News North. So someone has asked the question um, that how is it in the news media in the States seems to back specific political parties. So, you know, CNN is more democratic one, so one could say Fox is Republican. So what drives that alignment? Is it money or, or what is it? Well, yeah, you know, CNN did not used to be as, um, you know, so, um, in the bag of the left as it is now, right? I mean, it used to uh, be a more centrist persuasion. 
But what's happened in the media, and it's happened not just uh, in Fox and uh, CNN, although Fox certainly helped trigger it because they, they, they went first in the ideological direction, but opinion journalism has taken over, I can tell you that, because uh, when I first started doing columns from the Globe ages ago, there were hardly any other Globe columnists. Now I'm one of about, I don't know, 20 or something. Every paper, as uh, what happened was, um, editors found out that opinion journalism sold. And so they brought more and more opinion journalism into the papers and the papers became less and less objective. And uh, we, see, we see that with, um, uh, with the Fox News and CNN examples. And now CNN is uh, terribly one-sided on their panels. They have, you know, four or five liberals and one, uh, one token, uh, token uh, person on, on the right. And so to go back to how we started this talk this evening, this again polarizes the country because they're getting ideological points of view as opposed to centrist points of view. Centrist points of view don't sell. That's mm -hmm. what you know, the, the boss at CNN has found. If I try and be balanced, I'm going to lose viewership. And so how does the country get out of this trap? I don't think uh, it can get out of that trap. I mean, you're going to see them put the, some putting controls on the uh, big social media networks, and that's, and that's going to help. But uh, it's free media down there, and it's going to continue to uh, do what it wants to do and uh, appeal to little pockets of the population, right, left, and very few of them in the middle. And people go to those places, those outlets, to have their own biases confirmed. And the biases then get deeper and deeper in the, in, in the individual concerned. So our next question is about Joe Biden. So Joe Biden's the oldest American president who's been elected. And the question is, can Joe Biden be strong mentally over the next four years, do you think? Yeah, this was a big concern early in the campaign. Uh, you know, uh, old Joe, yesterday's man, uh, he's now 78. Um, it's extraordinary because uh, no president, uh, I remember when Ronald Reagan became president at 69, he was the, he was the oldest. Um, and now we have, uh, well, Donald Trump, uh, like 74 now. Uh, somebody, some might say his, uh, his mind got addled at a far earlier age. But um, Biden, um, I don't think he's, I, I don't think he's showing uh, his age mentally. Um, uh, I don't think he's in mental decline as, uh, as uh, some of the conservatives suggest. I've watched him for a few years now, and I first saw him back in the 1970s. You know, he started in the Senate back in the early 70s. Um, he's still on top of things. And early in the primaries, he stumbled a bit. He, he seemed to have trouble finding his, uh, his wavelengths in those debates. But since he's become president, uh, he's speaking with confidence. He's more articulate. He still stumbles some. But no, I still think his, uh, his mind is... Uh, well enough to, to do the job. Uh, I don't think he'd be as alert as he was at some point in time, but I think maybe that uh, people say he's gonna be, uh, be a one-term president, good chance of that, also a good chance that, uh, that he might uh, wanna go on to, what would it be, 86? 86, wow. Well, I'll be retired when I'm 86, that's for sure. Okay, so how much responsibility falls on Mitch McConnell for the current level of divisiveness in the United States? Now he's minority leader. Now they almost won the Senate. Uh, um, they lost by a hair or he would have been majority leader um, and would have been more of a pain. But um, he's a wily character, you know. Um, it's gonna be interesting, by the way, to see how he votes on the Trump impeachment. He's sort of hinting that, um, you know, he's still trying to give the vote in part in his party, the voters conscience. He, he possibly could vote against Trump. That would be absolutely amazing. I think that, um, well, I mentioned earlier the story about Obama's book and Obama saying, you know, the, the, the son of a gun came after me on everything, but I can understand it because that's the way to win the journey opposition. So, um, and so, you know, this guy, um, McConnell has just been reelected to another six years. Uh, we thought he was gonna stiff a, face a stiffer challenge in Kentucky, he won easily. Um, and um, he is um, he is going to be the same uh, thorn in the side of Democrats that he's been for up to now. So, do you think um, 
if he votes no, like if he votes to impeach, it's part of his effort to get to rid the party of Trump? Yes. I mean, I think down deep, he would love to get rid of Trump. I think if there was a secret ballot among those senators, three quarters of them would uh, vote to get rid of Trump. They're afraid of him. Um, they're afraid that uh, if they if they don't go with them, uh, the Trump forces will uh, go into their constituencies and, uh, and defeat them in the next election um, or work against them or that, uh, that, that Trump will, will, uh, will uh, insult them so much it'll drive them crazy. And so that's what it is. Uh, it's, um, it's a uh, situation like that and it's uh, really sad. It um, really speaks to the lack of integrity of some of these uh, people that um, um, they know who he is. They know how bad for the country he is, um, but uh, they're going to stick with him to save their own skin. So 70 million Americans voted for Trump. So can the Republicans actually control or manage the Trump loyalists without Trump? It depends uh, who they would get, you know. Um, who are some of the stars in the party now? Uh, Nikki Haley, the former United Nations ambassador, seems to be striding that uh, gap between the Republican moderates and the Republican uh, extremists. If they have somebody like that who comes forward and who can speak to both sides, which is really hard to do, um, I could see them uh, maybe, maybe uh, getting away with it um, or, or doing some healing. But <clears throat> As we were saying earlier, it's so hard to see the Trump forces um, um, receding um, without a Trump leading them. And like I say, if not Donald Trump, it'll be his son who's a real hothead, Don Jr. Maybe even Ivanka, which, uh, which I tend to doubt. But I think Don Jr. would be the guy and he's just as bad as uh, Trump himself. And he would have a great following. Do you think, that, is there ever going to be political will to change the electoral system in the U.S. to make the system fairer and more equitable? No. Um, you know, there's talk of um, amending the um, electoral college system, which needs to be changed. I mean, you know, if you, if you win the popular vote, you should win. Although in Canada, we have a system in which, you know, parties win the popular vote and they don't, they don't govern either. Um, but the Electoral College uh, has, has become a real uh, uh, headache. Um, you have um, the financial uh, system in the United States. It's so awful compared to Canada where it's so regulated. There it's totally unregulated. Um, not quite as bad now, however, in the sense that, you know, candidates can go online and raise so much money that way. So the, uh, the billionaire candidates don't have quite the extent of the advantage uh, they have before. Um, but I don't see any, any, any finance reforms coming uh, to the election system. I don't see any uh, reforms to the uh, primary system, which is kind of fun. It goes on for so long. It's great fun as you're a journalist. Yeah. And it, it does weed out a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, contenders gives them a shot at it and there's some advantages to it but no I don't see a big change in the system. Um, we've had a couple questions around um, what would your reflections be about um, what was what what good did the Trump administration do for the United States? Yes well I think um, Trump ha um, did deliver in terms of uh, economic buoyancy um, you know, his tax cut was heavily slanted toward the, uh, toward the wealthy, which the non-wealthy did not like so much. But um, being this, you know, having this big businessman type image, big buccaneer type of image, big swashbuckler, you know, uh, Manhattan guy, um, he, he, he gave buoyancy to the, to the markets um, in terms of his economic stewardship, Listen, he had a very happy economic cycle. Um, anybody uh, as president would have looked pretty good on the economic front, given the cycle that the Americans uh, were, were turning to when uh, he took over power. Another thing I, I, I did mention earlier, another thing that Trump did was, uh, you know, 
shrink the war mentality in the United States, you know, by saying we don't need these endless wars. We can't go ever to, on forever defending everybody in the world. Oh, we're losing billions and billions of dollars of that, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, at the same time, though, he did, uh, you know, spend uh, increased military spending. So he sort of contradicted himself in, in that sort of respect. And the third thing I think he did that was pretty good was he gave voice to, um, he gave voice to a lot of the um, uh, voiceless uh, in America, um, the type of person who sort of hates politics and hates politicians um, and hates Washington. There's so many million of out, out there and Donald Trump spoke their language uh, and he got their support because he used a type of language that you would use around the bar and insulting everybody and throwing out poor little and um, on Twitter every day and, and those people loved it. and. You know, for better or for worse, but uh, uh, maybe for worse when you see what it what it's led to for some of them, uh, this part of uh, of America was given a voice, a bigger voice. In your um, in your talk, you talked about um, uh, the primaries and Pete Buttigieg going to to Biden, and then um, Amy Klobuchar, um, which sort of put Bernie on the uh, um, out of the race. So. Someone asked, how much trouble will the left wing of the Democrats pose for Biden? The Bernie, the Bernie fans, the Bernie, the Bernie supporters. <clears throat> oh, good question. I don't think they're going to pose much problem because if you look at the Biden agenda, um, that uh, he's leaned over to accommodate uh, Bernie Sanders and the left. Sanders, by the way, deserves a great deal of credit um, for moving that party in the left direction. He's been the godfather of policy for that party for the last uh, many years. Uh, he's made it a more progressive party. Um, Biden is aware of that. Biden is aware of the strength of uh, people like uh, um, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's a, a phenomenal talent. Um, and he realizes that's where the party is moving. And even though, you know, some of these policies might not be his first choice, he realizes he's got to take the party there, like in the direction of the $15 uh, minimum wage, for example which is a big, big turn and which is already raising hackles on the right. So I think he's, uh, Joe Biden is gonna be able to bridge the, the, the left moderate divide in that party very well. So we've had a, a number of questions about Kamala Harris. Like, so, you know, it was a big moment when she took the oath for vice president of the United States. What do you, what do you think her impact uh, will be? And do you see her as a future president? Another extraordinary luck story, eh? I mean, uh, I remember going to her uh, events, uh, oh, well over a year ago, and uh, she was the up and comer, uh, in, supposedly in the primaries, and then she bombed out totally. She didn't even get to the first primary. She, yeah. she stepped down, and it was so humiliating for her, and we thought, oh, well, that's the end of Kamala Harris, right? And then uh, a few months later, she's vice president of the United States. Well, you know, as, as I said, I just spoke about uh, luck in politics. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, luck is about 70% oh, of your success in politics depends on the breaks you get, depends on the opposition you get, whether it's a weak opposition or a strong opposition. Um, you go back through Canadian prime ministers who've had any duration and you can just chart the lucky breaks they've got. So she was that. Now, I think that uh, she is in a super powerful position to, um, as vice president, uh, to be the, you know, the lead Democratic contender uh, next time around. Um, she will face a, a strong slate of candidates. Uh, vice presidents, though, have a, a big, big um, advantage. I think she's going to be very careful as vice president, supporting Joe. You've seen her so far. She hasn't really said much. Um, and she hasn't really been given a, a, a big role yet, but she will get one, and she will be very careful uh, not to create much controversy to, uh, to prepare for, uh, hopefully, uh, in her case, uh, Joe, Bar Joe Biden stepping down before the, uh, before the next uh, election in, uh, in, 19, uh, in, uh, in uh, 1924. So one of the most popular questions we got, we're, we, we'll have time for just maybe a couple of more, um, was, 
going to do it into two part one. Will Trump run for president in 2024? And do the Democrats have a plan B to ensure that Trump never holds office, public office again, beyond the current trial if the vote is not in their favor? Well, I don't know how they could have a plan B because um, <laughs> what could it be other than uh, the um, impeachment? Uh, they failed on one impeachment to, to win it in the Senate trial. Looks like they're going to fail on this one. I think, uh, by the way, they should have prepared better for this. I think they should have. Um, there's so many questions unanswered, uh, so many much information we don't know about uh, Trump forces behind being behind this invasion of the Capitol. I think it, I think they should have, you know, they're being criticized for by the Republicans, rightly so, for making a rush to judgment on this thing. Why didn't they turn it over to an independent commission, investigate it for a few months, then report, then base their base their impeachment on the, on the commission's report. But anyway, um, I think that um, um, Trump will probably survive next week. Uh, Trump will want to survive. Even if he goes to jail, he'll want to come back. I think there's probably a, not go to jail maybe, but I think he's going to be hit for some pretty serious charges along the line that he might have trouble getting out of. Um, and Democrats will be hoping that they knock him over. But uh, the guy's been... Uh, um, Relentlessly, um, relentlessly. What's uh, what's the word for relentlessly resilient throughout his career? I mean, the guy's had so many bankruptcies, so many failures, uh, so many fumbles as president. He just keeps getting up and coming at you. And you got to admire the guy for that resilient streak in him. And so I don't think he's ready to back down yet. And uh, I think that um, you know, depending on the way the country goes, depending on the way the economy goes, um, if Joe Biden ran into a lot of trouble, uh, if the economy got into a bad stretch um, and uh, Trump was out there again um, with his following, then uh, then he would have a good shot in, uh, at, at winning again in uh, 1924 or 2024. <laughs> 2024. <laughs> Dating myself, well, man, wouldn't that be amazing if he actually <laughs> Oh my God. Well, bananas. It must feel, I mean, I think it just feels a little bit different now that he's off Twitter. It just seems like everything's sort of tamped down a little bit, but. Um, Extraordinary. Yeah, that is really is unbelievable. I and mean, every day he was pouring out this crazy stuff and now you don't see it. Yeah, it's good. Um, okay, so I just got a couple more questions I'm going to ask you. What did you learn from your years in Washington? Well, I learned about um, Americans and um, how different uh, we are than they. Um, I, I learned a lot about uh, the Canadians being a more deferential people, um, more subject to uh, listening to authority. I'd like to see this in their in their in their response to the pandemic. Like uh, you know, we're uh, you know okay. You tell us what to do on a pandemic, we'll do it. Whereas in the United States, half the population said, "The hell with you! I'm not wearing a mask. I'm going to a bar tonight." Right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's one thing I learned. I learned a lot about the, um, uh, the um, African-American population, which I really, really like to love those people and, and, and about the, the divide that, that's still uh, there. Um, and that um, it's just gonna take so many, many more decades, I think, to, uh, to, to rid it. Um, you know, even Barack Obama wasn't able to make that many strides in, in, in towards that, that healing. I learned to have a tremendous effect for the uh, American spirit, uh, the go get them type of spirit, um, the buccaneer spirit uh, that you see. I learned that there's two Americas though. I mean, there's the Eastern Seaboard America and there's uh, Middle West America. Um, and, uh, you know, they're just two totally, uh, uh, diverse uh, groups. There's many Americans, but primarily uh, those two, and they'll they'll never come come together. They are so different. So I, so what's the tougher assignment: covering Trump in Washington for this time period, or being in Moscow during um, to set up the uh, the the bureau when Gorbachev, like in '85? What what was the tougher assignment for you? Well. To go to Russia, I had to learn a lot of the language, uh, and the Russian language is fascinating to learn. It's it's you can do it by memory though. If you got a good memory, you can learn it. Um, and uh, so it was tougher, <laughs> tougher than language wise. But I you know I managed to to learn a lot of Russian. Um, but the story was 
wonderful to cover because I was lucky. I, I landed in Moscow in 1985, just after Gorbachev had come to power and Gorbachev started turning that society around. He started ending the Cold War. Uh, to me, uh, Gorbachev is one of the greatest figures of the, um, of the 21st century. Uh, and, and I love covering him. I loved going back in time. It was like going back to the horse and buggy age and away you go to the small towns away in the backwoods Soviet Union back then. And they, they still had horse and buggies. They didn't even have cash registers, the old abacus type of thing. Fascinating, fascinating time. And, uh, and the revolution did happen then. Um, Trump has been, <clears throat> well, he's been a, a real, real boon for journalism in that, you know, he, he created news every day because of his megalomaniacal streak. He has to be on the front page every day. It seemed like some days that he would even um, create a bad headline just to be in the headlines. <laughs> He was that egotistical. And so he had in the ratings of newspapers covering and TV stations covering Trump went up, up, up and up uh, because he made more news, five times more news than any other president. It was just absolutely extraordinary. So you were run off your feet. Part of the problem of being a Canadian in Washington, it, it, it's hard to cover because, um, you know, you, you want an interview with a senator and they don't care what you know, about a Canadian reporter. They never heard of the Globe and Mail, most of them. So he can't get access to people like they can, like say if you're in Ottawa or something. So that was, so that was made it difficult, but an absolutely incredible time there. And I'm really, really pleased that, uh, that I was there to see it. So my last question to you, because I learned a long time ago that even if he, a person is no longer your boss, you should always a ask a question that they submit. So Roger Troll, who you know well, was my yeah. boss and he's retired. So he sent in a question to me, I just see now. And he's wondering if you got to golf with Donald and if so, is it true he always cheats? <laughs> Roger, hello, how's your golf game? Roger's a very good golfer, by the way. I think he took me down a couple of times. He got really lucky with the flat stick. But um, the, the, um, I did play a few Washington courses. Um, I uh, love the weather down there because you could play all winter. So sharpened up my game that way. Um, Donald Trump, yes, uh, stories are, I didn't play with him. Uh, stories are voluminous about uh, Donald Trump uh, cheating on the golf course. Uh, he wasn't the only one, though. Bill Clinton had a, uh, a great reputation for uh, for doing that, as did a couple of other presidents. So, you know, he doesn't, uh, he isn't as unique uh, in, that, in that respect. The Canadian ambassador, David uh, McNaughton, he was um, invited to play with Trump by another ambassador. And the ambassador called him one day and he said, um, so um, I've got a game with uh, uh, Trump today. Uh, why don't you come along? And David McNaughton thought the guy was kidding. And, um, you know, and so he didn't turn up at the tee at noon the next day. And the guy calls him at noon the next day and saying, hey, I'm here with Trump. You're going to stand up the president. And so, <laughs> so the Canadian ambassador uh, stood up the president of the United States, didn't go for them. There you go. Well, I guess it's presidential um, privilege to actually always take a mulligan. But thankfully, we did not have to take a mulligan during this talk. Um, Lawrence, we you really appreciate the time that you uh, spent preparing uh, for the talk and, and answering all these questions. Again, we've never had so many questions for uh, any of our talks since we've gone all virtual. Very so, good questions, yeah. Yeah, fantastic questions. So thank you for your time and your insight. Um, we're certainly going to keep reading um, your column in the Globe as you document the next few years of Biden. And uh, hopefully you'll get to a little bit more opportunity to, to get that golf game going. And I'm sure Roger will go golfing with you anytime. So anytime, that'd be great. Thank you so much, McMaster. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so that's it for uh, United States at the Crossroads. Uh, look forward to future emails about different events that we have coming up. And uh, thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. Have a good night.